the story of Christ did not end with his death and resurrection. Instead, it culminated with his gift being bestowed on the early church. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so it was. The early church carried the gospel across nations, and what you do when you leave here carries the story further. The Book of Acts. Well, I'm just listening to see how the Spirit wants us to go down. I invite you to take your Bibles uh, and turn to Acts chapter 2, the Bible in front of you. You can turn to page 1081. You can take out your Bible app because we roll that way or in any other way that you, you want to access the scriptures. Please do that right now as I give you the categories and the subjects that we're going to talk about as we look at Acts chapter 2. Number one is connections. Number two is reactions. Then I'm going to give you some insights into what I call the experience spectrum. Then we're going to listen to the core message of how the early church preached Jesus. And finally, we're going to live it. We're going to live the life. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 8 begins us this morning. It says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there was dwelling in Jerusalem at that time Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language and they were amazed. They were astonished, and they said, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? So how is it that we hear each of us his own native language? One of the great payoffs of becoming a serious student of the Bible is when you can start making connections between what's in the Old Testament and what's happening in the New Testament. And here in the first eight verses of Acts chapter 2, we have two amazing Old Testament connections. Let's start with this visible and auditor auditory phenomenon. On the day of Pentecost, everyone there heard a sound. It's a sound that we call kind of a train going down the tracks. That's when you know the tornado has, is heading towards your town. That, that, that sound of, 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 a, of a wind, a strong wind rushing in the trees and rushing across the land. It was that sound. That's what they heard. And then they saw fire in the sky coming down and then strangely splitting off into little pieces resting on each one of those believers. That's what they heard. That's what they saw. But we have heard and seen this before. We've seen God's special effects manifestation before in Exodus chapter 19. That's the episode where the people of God have just been delivered from Egypt. They're now in the wilderness and now they're going to meet God at the mountain that's called Sinai. And as they stood before that mountain, God came down with his presence. And as the presence of God hit Mount Sinai, there was a sound of rushing wind. The ground underneath of them shook. There was fire blazing across the mountain. And the people of God said, no thanks. We're, we're good. Moses, you go up on the mountain and you talk to God. We'll stay right here because the sound of the wind, the shaking of the ground, and the power of the fire is too much for us. So Moses went up on the mountain, spent time with God, and then came back down with the covenant, that sacred relationship between these beleaguered, formerly slaved people and this gracious and glorious God. The feature of that covenant was the Ten Commandments. What to believe, how to relate to God, and how to treat one another. The perfect outline to live a perfectly pleasing life in worship to God and love for one another. And the rest of the Old Testament is basically the chronicle of how they never kept the covenant. They just didn't do it. But you should be asking why. You've read the Old Testament and said, what's wrong with these people? I'll tell you what's wrong with these people. They had a perfect plan to live and worship God. They just couldn't do it. They didn't have it in them. 
They just didn't have the consistent willpower. They didn't have the consistent determination. They didn't have the consistent spiritual passion. They didn't have an ongoing fervor to follow through on what God had simply given them to live a blessed life. They just didn't have it in them. And so on the day of Pentecost, when that fire of the Lord appeared again, it split off and rested on each one of them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, it says. And now through the power of the Holy Spirit, they have it within them because the power is now in them. It's the power to love Lord, the Lord consistently. It's the power to like reading your Bible, find delight in prayer, want to come to worship, want to tell others about Jesus, want to lay down your life in a life of servanthood. You want to, you do, you have the energy, you have the passion, you have the power because now it's within you. See, it was, just, it was just fire on the mountain in the Old Testament. Now it's the fire of passion in their lives, in their hearts, in the energy center of actually living and doing this life. From ancient fire to fresh anointing. And oh, by the way, did I tell you that on the day of Pentecost, the thousands of Jewish men were there to celebrate how God made a covenant with Israel and how God showed his presence on the mountain. And now it was fulfilled with inner dwelling Holy Spirit power. Connections from what happens in the Old Testament to what's happening in you today. The second connection is really, really interesting but not talked about as much. And let's talk about this phenomenon of these words that were gushing out of, these, of the mouths of these 120 people. Now, here's what you need to know. The 120 who received the baptism of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost were having words gush out of their mouths, and they did not understand a single syllable that they were speaking. They're, they're thinking to themselves, I am speaking all of these words. I don't know a single one of what these words mean, but I'm just going to let the Holy Spirit deliver it through me. But the people in the audience, if you will, the congregation, the thousands who were gathered, they heard the message of Jesus spoken in their native language. The Jews from Parthenon is going, how are these Galileans know my language? The Jews from Phrygia said, how do they speak my dialect of Phrygian? Those from the Babylonian region said, how are these local yokels even possible to know the complexities of my language? I can hear them speak it clearly, and they're talking about Jesus. How can you explain that? Miracle, sign, power. I've observed this phenomenon myself about 10 times. It's, just, it's really, really cool. Someone under the anointing of the Holy Spirit is just releasing a language that is being given to them instantaneously, letting it gush out of their mouths. They don't understand anything that they're saying, but someone who is there saying, I never know you could speak Thai. When did you learn my language? said, I don't even know that I'm speaking your language. And everyone in the assembly was full of awe at the greatness of the Lord. Very, very, very cool. But here's the connection to the Old Testament that I promised you. It takes us back to Genesis chapter 11, a disastrous episode in the history of humanity. That is where the Tower of Babel took place, right? That big building project that humanity was going to build to throw God off his throne, take over heaven and earth, and pretty much destroy themselves as a result. And they were making progress. Because the same language and understood each other perfectly. And the mercy of our God, he confused their languages and divided them so that they wouldn't come together and destroy themselves. But now in Acts chapter 2, the curse has been reversed. The disunity among humanity that was needed so they didn't destroy everything is now coming back unto a great mighty force of unity in the preaching of Jesus Christ. Because in Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter where you were born, it doesn't matter how much money you have, it doesn't matter your race, gender, sexual identity, or anything else that tends to split people off from one another. There is some, a force in the world that is greater than all that divides us, and that is the love of Jesus Christ being poured into people's lives. 
And now as all the different representatives of people and places heard about the love of Jesus Christ, let themselves be embraced by it, they immediately embraced, embraced each other as brother, sister, family. How many have found that? Wherever you go in the world, I found it over and again, where there are Christians, your home. Where there are Christians, there is family. And the message of Jesus Christ, which is for all people everywhere, no exception, is the one force at work on this earth that actually can hold humanity together, bring humanity together, and help us to live in understanding, appreciation, mutuality, affection, love, and support of one another. It's needed more every day, and it's a power that if we would just embrace it, we'll start making a difference in our day and in our time. The curse was reversed, and now it's possible for people to love one another in mutuality. There are some connections between what happened on Pentecost Day and what is taught in the Old Testament. Now, the next one is, is reactions. There were a lot of people that, there that day and they all had, well, some very different reactions. Let's take a look in Acts chapter 12 through 14. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does all this mean? But others, mocking, said, they are all filled with new wine. Well, two very different reactions to this amazing spiritual phenomenon, right? Some people were going, I don't know exactly what's going on, but for some reason I'm really excited about it and I want to understand more. And others just said, no, this is stupid. Don't you just love the this is stupid crowd? I mean, we were all members of it in eighth grade, right? Those of you who have or will have middle schoolers, they're going to spend some time on the this is stupid crowd, all right? So there you go. You have those two reactions very different in this big crowd. But what I also want you to understand is that the people making these two very different reactions were all religious people. We're not talking about different reactions between believers and unbelievers. They were all observantly religious. They were all trying to be devout to God. And yet some of them were like ready to see what it was all about and others of them wanted nothing to do about it. You know what? I have found that reaction still to be true in the church today. Because human nature, you know, in the church today, when the Holy Spirit shows up to do something spectacular, weird, wonderful, crazy, people are crying, kneeling, worshiping, just out in the Lord. When that happens, if that happens, you get two different reactions. Some people are going to look at it and say, you know what, I, I'm, I've never really done that. But I feel the presence of the Lord in it. And wherever it is the, where the presence of the Lord is, I want it. And I want to learn more. You get that reaction. And then you get the other reaction that says, whatever that is, keep it out of this church and never let it come back. And I've seen that response my whole career. In the church, in the work of the Holy Spirit. And that is why I talk about the experience continuum. Verse 14. Take a look. But Peter... Standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them and said, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. So Peter immediately grounds this experience in Scripture. And begins to tell them what they are seeing based on Scripture. Now, here's the part where a lot of preachers don't go, which is why I'm eager to go there. What exactly were these thousands of people witnessing these 120 people do? What exactly did they see them doing? I will tell you what they saw them doing. They saw them standing there but not with very good balance because it felt like, like the ground was shaking underneath them. They saw them hugging each other and saying, I love you so much. And then they were crying and shouting and laughing. They were acting like people who were really hammered. 
Send your emails to pastor at gschurch.us. No, that's what it says. They said, they are just hammered. Nine o'clock in the morning. And they're that hammered. Now, I assume that's what they were doing. Of course, personally, I don't know anything about it, and I've never seen a drunk person. But I've seen YouTube videos, and that's what they were doing. And so it begs a very important question, and that question is this. Is the weird stuff related to the Holy Spirit actually necessary? And the answer is absolutely yes, it is. Let's talk about the experience continuum. Some Christians, because God made them that way, are very rational, like to be very much in control, like everything around them to be very predictable, and will go through the motions of worship the best they can because that's how they roll and that's how they want it. That's one part of the experience continuum. Other Christians... They're just chasing experiences all the time. And the crazier, the better. And if, and if crazy things aren't happening in the church, they'll fake it till they make it. Those are the two extremes of the experience continuum. All of us are likely somewhere in between. But the real question is this. Are those things necessary? And yes, they are. And let's really understand this. It's not about... Stumbling around drunk in the spirit or speaking in tongues. It's not about that. It's about the Holy Spirit saying, if I bring this to you and I take you over, if I take control of you completely in this way, will you let me? Will you let me take over your mouth, your balance, your dignity, your control? To the people who love control, the Holy Spirit says, will you let me cause you to be completely out of control? And of course, to those who are just chasing the crazy all the time, love the weird, Holy Spirit very likely said, will you sit down, be still, pay attention, open your Bible, read a book, study some doctrine, get intellectually engaged in your faith so that I have more space to be in your life. Wherever you are on the spiritual continuum, the Holy Spirit wants to meet you there and take you farther into what he has for you. It's not about speaking in tongues. It's about willingness to surrender your mouth. It's not about dancing and dancing and dancing and dancing. It's about doing in obedience whatever the Holy Spirit says, which also includes studying, grounding, and intellectual development. You see, everybody likes the theory of the spirit-filled life, right? I, would you like to leave, lead the spirit-filled life? Yes, I would like to lead the spirit-filled life. Yeah, but here's the thing. It comes down to giving up control and putting aside your preference to go the Holy Spirit's way. So the Holy Spirit will come to you and say, Will you allow me to take you over completely? The Holy Spirit will come to you and say, will you allow me to discipline you in maturity more profoundly? That's the Spirit-filled life, my friends, letting the Holy Spirit have utter and complete control. The experience continuum, where does the Holy Spirit want to meet you in it today? Let's talk about the core message. I mean, Peter now has a, a crowd, and so of course he's going to preach. And this is what he said. It's up on the screen. This Jesus, God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. So let all of the house of Israel know, I love this, for certain that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus, whom you had crucified. But now you can repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus and you can receive the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> what are you to do with this man, Jesus? Believe in him. Believe that he is divine son of God. If you will say, I do believe it, I do, then it will hit you. It will hit you where you are in relationship with Jesus, which is not where you should be. And so you repent. Repent. And repentance means this, is to admit that Jesus had to die for you because you're a guilty sinner. 
And you see that sounds so dire and depressing and kind of difficult, but here's the beautiful thing. If you will admit that Jesus had to die for you because you're a guilty sinner, you will immediately realize that he did die for you because he loves you. And now you're born again. And so you're going to get baptized in water. And now you're going to receive the gracious gift of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to start living the life, living the life. And that's the last thing that we have to look at this morning. Living the life. Now what? Watch a lot of people over the years enter the now what phase. It's such a joy. It's like, oh my gosh, my life has totally changed. I am, I am absolutely a Christian. I, 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 I want to live this life and be this person for the rest of my life. What do I do? <laughs> what do I do next? Well, you live the life. And one of the things that the book of Acts is going to teach us over and over and over again is this. The product of a new life in Jesus is the new community of Jesus. Once you're in with Jesus, you're in with fellow believers. That's how you live the life. Look at verse 42. Maybe one of the most important verses in the New Testament, certainly worth looking at. It says, And now the thousands of new believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. As often as they could, they got together to learn more from the Bible about Jesus. What are you doing right now? You've come together to learn more about Jesus from the Bible. You are living the life. You are doing well. You are right on track. We are functioning as a New Testament church because we are together learning more about Jesus. And then they had the fellowship they weren't always just listening to sermons. They were listening to each other. They were becoming, wait for it, friends. They were learning where each other grew up and how you got to good shepherd, what you do for a job, what your family is like. You get to know each other. You begin to like each other. That's so absolutely important in the Christian faith. You should know more people who are Christians on a consistent basis, and the ones you already know, know more deeply. That's how you live the life. It's not so bad, let me tell you. It's pretty wonderful. But you also break the bread, which is a direct reference to taking Holy Communion, which we do, and you have done, every Sunday, because we live the life here, and you're part of it. And finally, we say the prayers. You know each other more, you're in a small group, you're eating in each other's homes, you're getting close. And you add prayer to that. Prayer for each other, over each other, and with each other. And in that way, you live the life. Connections, reactions. Where are you on the experience continuum? The core message you have now heard, and your invitation is to come and live the life. Let me give you some applications for today's message. First of all, the first application is to use your church app. You can get it at Good Shepherd Sacramento. And we've just added a reading plan, a daily reading in the book of Acts that will have you reading the book of Acts in the next 40 days. You just tap it every day. You can read it while you're at the stoplight. The people behind you will be so blessed. Or you can go to the website, and it's up there too. So read through the book of Acts in the next 40 days and drink it in and let it live. Secondly, next time that we do small groups, get in in a small group. We do them regularly so that people can jump in when they're ready or as needed, and it will happen again before long. And this time, right now, you say, I'm going to be in a small group. I'm going to learn more in somebody's home, become greater friends, and we're going to pray together. The third one, obviously, is this. If you are not baptized, be baptized. We'll do it. If you're not a member of this church or a member of no church, join the church so you can live the life. And the final application today as we close is to stand with me and pray. So please stand. And let's pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Well, I got a sense early this morning when I was here that I was not to spend a lot of time praying at this moment. It was as if the Lord said, don't worry, I have this teed up. So I'm going to go with that. 
I believe that the Lord's been speaking to you for some time about an area in your life where you need to give him complete control. I believe the Lord's been speaking to you from, for some time about an area in your life where you're meant to let the Holy Spirit take complete control. So you and the Lord work that out right now. You're safe. It is sacred. The very atmosphere is love, grace, and acceptance. The very spiritual atmosphere crackles with the closeness of God and the work of the Holy Spirit. So use this moment to tell the Holy Spirit that you're inviting him to take over complete control of that particular area of your life. And now, Father, I pray for every person brave and vulnerable enough to take that huge step that with your son Jesus, you would send down now an even greater work of the power of the Holy Spirit into their lives. Lord, give us the strength of follow-through. Give us the determination of resolve. Give us the joy of wanting to see breakthrough and encourage each person on this next part of their journey to break through into the joy of the Lord and the peace that comes in full surrender. Take it over, Holy Spirit. Take it over now. And thank you for the peace. Hallelujah. It's good. Hmm. And we just lift this up and trust it into the nail-scarred hands of Jesus and pray in his name. Amen.